In our family recently, we found ourselves using the phrase treading water uh, a lot. It just keeps cropping up in different contexts. So one of them, for example, uh, Jono was meant to be at university this year, and he uh, held off deferred for a year because of COVID. Uh, and another one is that Dan is still living at home, and he was supposed to be gone by now. Uh, uh, he's going to be living in Cardiff for a while, or, or London, and, and he hasn't gone. Again, uh, that's been put on hold because of COVID. Uh, and one that we're all very aware of uh, is that everybody wants to be uh, meeting together in this building instead of online. And this feeling that we have that pervades all the different areas of our lives, I think, at the moment, is that we're not getting where we want to be going. We're stuck in one place. We're sort of swimming in circles. Because uh, we all thought, didn't we, that COVID was going to be over by now. And there's nothing new under the sun, really. So our experience with this is very similar to the experience the Israelites had in the stories that Nikki read to us. Now, they thought that they would be through the desert long before either of these stories happened. How long do you think it takes to walk from Egypt to Israel, as the Israelites needed to do in, in those books? Um, here's someone on Quora. He writes, let's say you wanted to walk from Cairo to Jerusalem. It's about 730 kilometers if you take the route via Taba near Eliat on the Gulf of Aquaba. Walking six hours a day, it would take you a little under three weeks. Now, Google Maps says uh, 1,037 kilometers and says it would take 211 hours to walk. So if you go six hours a day, it's more like five weeks. Or if you want to take it easy, take weekends off, just walk five days a week, seven weeks. How long did it take them? 40 years. Now, I think that's how we feel about COVID now. You know, when this started and we went into the first lockdown, probably most of us were thinking, all right, this will be a month or two. And here we are, a year and a half in, and um, although we've got a date where they're talking about relaxing restrictions, if you're following the numbers, it's not looking good. If we do relax the restrictions, there'll probably be another lockdown to follow. And I think that our position is very much like uh, how things were for the Israelites at that time, that same sense of frustration of going in circles. Uh, and that's why I had Nikki read both of those two stories today, even though they're so similar. Uh, one is from Exodus, and then you've got the whole book of Leviticus in between, and then the book of Numbers. We have this very similar story again. So they're not two accounts of the same story, like the way in the New Testament the Gospels tell the same stories about Jesus. They're two separate accounts. Uh, it's one history telling how the same thing happened twice. And it's very much how we feel, I think, about the idea that infections are rising again, and we're thinking, well, are we back here again? We've been wandering for not 40 years, thankfully, but you know, sometimes it can feel like it, and yet we're back where we started. So what can we learn from the experience they had then? Uh, in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago, the people we're talking about now. He says these things happened to them as examples for us, and they were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So it's not coincidence, you know, that, that we are now living the way that we're living. Christians have been through this kind of thing for thousands of years. Not this exact thing, of course, not this infection, but through tough times. And times that are not just tough, but that seem to go on and on with the same kind of toughness and come back to difficult places just when we think we're through them. What an encouraging message this is. Now, at present, then, our lives are not the way we want them to be. Right here and now, it's not what we want. So there are two alternatives that you might think of, uh, and they would be to live in the past or to live in the future. Think about how things used to be or about how things are going to be. So if the present's no good, you've got the past and the future. Well, what does the Bible say about those two approaches? Not encouraging. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 10, Solomon warns people, don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. So I've, I've always taken that as a little bit of a rebuke. If I 
I want to talk about how music these days isn't as good as it used to be, which, by the way, is true, but saying so is not wise, according to Solomon. Right? It's no good thinking about the good old days. It doesn't get you anywhere. So what about looking ahead then and living in the future and talking about, you know, we get this a lot, don't we? People saying, oh, soon we'll be back to normal. Soon we'll be meeting the building again. Soon we'll be able to sing together. And, well, what does Jesus say uh, in Matthew 6, verse 34? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, look, I'm not saying we can't look forward to good things, of course. I'm not saying that we shouldn't look forward to when we are together, when we can sing together, all those things. But if our hope is fixed on those things, we're not helping ourselves. That's not what Jesus encourages us to do. So what are we left with then? If the present is no good, thinking about the past is not wise, thinking about the future is borrowing trouble. Let's see what C.S. Lewis says about this. Uh, you probably know Lewis as the uh, writer who gave us the Narnia books, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, and so on. But he wrote a lot more besides that, and, and for my money, is the most consistently wise Christian writer I know. And here's what he wrote in a book called The Screwtape Letters. Humans live in time, but God destines them to eternity. He therefore wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which we call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Of the present moment, and of it only, humans have an experience like the experience that God has of reality as a whole. He would therefore have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present, either meditating on their eternal union with him or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. The devil's business is to keep us away from the present by making us focus on the future. Now, Living in the past or the future, then, is a bad response to the pandemic if we agree with Solomon and with Jesus and indeed with C.S. Lewis. So what are we left with? How can we focus our lives in a time like this? Well, there are two answers. One of them is very obvious. The other, if you were paying attention, you would have seen coming. But let's look at the first. It is living in the present. Now, the present isn't what we want it to be. But that doesn't mean that we just opt out of it and let it drift past us. Now, we can honestly recognize that our circumstances are not what we want them to be. And we should do that. You know, we should be honest with ourselves and with each other and say, yeah, this is not what we wanted. This isn't how we want this year to be. And yet, at the same time, we don't need to make that the focus of our lives, make it a life mission to change them. Let me read you these verses from, uh, again, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Quite surprising verses, really, written to people. Well, you'll see. He says, Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Now, isn't that surprising that Paul writes even to people who are literally slaves that their main goal isn't necessarily to get out of slavery? Don't let it trouble you, he says. And when you compare our situation with that, it doesn't look so bad. Paul's words to us would be the same. In a sense, don't let it trouble you. So this is hard. You know, these are, are, are difficult words. They're welcome, but they're not easy to follow. And yet, if we think about the lives of other Christians through history, again, our situation is uh, uh, enviable, really, compared with the people Paul and the other apostles were writing to. The early church was consistently under persecution by Romans, under emperors like Caligula and Nero, proper tyrants. And, you know, we talk today about Christians in Britain being persecuted, when we talk about that, what we mean is things like when an employer has a code that says you're not allowed to wear a necklace, we don't get a special exemption if it's a cross. Now look, 
Persecution means being torn to pieces by lions in an arena in Rome. Um, or, uh, closer to us in time, but not in space, there are Christians living in uh, Islamic countries where they know they can only ever meet in secret. They are never going to be getting together in a building like this and singing together in public and inviting people. It's no good them thinking, oh, well, we'll look forward to a few months where we don't have to wear masks. No, that's, that's their life. That's what it's going to be like. Or we can think about uh, African slaves before the Civil War in America, southern states of America, knowing that their whole lives would be spent in slavery and yet glimpsing something of the greatness and the goodness of God uh, and living moment to moment in circumstances that were appalling but finding God's grace in those moments. So I think the call of God for us certainly in, in what's written by Paul and others, is to live in the present moment and to embrace where we are now with all its restrictions and all its difficulties, not pretending they don't exist, recognizing the reality, but living in them nevertheless. So how do we do this? Well, I think there are two things to bear in mind. And the first of those is this, just to enjoy the little victories. And I, I, I think it would be very sad if we became so aware of things that are not how we want that we lose the ability to enjoy, for example, the moment when sunshine breaks through the clouds, or on a hot day, the moment of a cooling breeze, or of um, baking something that your children love, or uh, a topical one, of course, the England football team winning a, a match 4-0. And even if you don't like football, you who I'm speaking to right now, I bet you know and love people who care about it, and you can share in, in that enjoyment. Or what else? You know, think about where we live. When you look out from the, the little car park, the most picturesque spot in Cinderford is the little car park with its view across the forest. Uh, or the distant mountains that you can often see across to um, Wales. Or moments where just things like uh, you've got a bit of spare money at the end of the week, you uh, pop out and pick up something nice from a takeaway. You know, all these things that are not big and exciting, they're not life-changing holidays, they're not mountaintop moments, they're the stuff of life day to day. They're the little blessings that God gives us moment by moment, day by day, to get through things. So that's the first thing, is enjoying those little victories. The second thing follows straight from it, and that is that we can seek God in the day to day. We can find him in those moments. Now, we think about the uh, Israelites again, and their situation. They were in a physical desert. They needed physical refreshment. And where did they get it? From a physical rock. Water flowed out from the rock. Now, in our situation, we're not physically in a desert, but we're in a desert. It's a metaphorical desert, a figurative desert. Um, and like Moses, we can get the refreshment that we need from the rock. What's our rock? Who is our rock? David tells us in Psalm 18, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. And this is a metaphor you see a few times in the Bible, that God is our rock. And we need his presence in our lives. Now more than ever, in a time of pandemics, in a time of lockdowns and easing and locking down again and, and going round and round and landing up in the same situation, more than ever, we need God himself in our lives. So part of that is we learn to see him in all those little victories. When we see that shaft of light breaking through the clouds, we learn to recognize that as just a, a, a glimpse of the goodness of God. When we eat something really delicious, we recognize it not just as something that's delicious, but as a blessing from God. And all those things, every good thing in our lives, we're told every good and perfect gift comes from God. And the more we see that, the more we recognize that, the more deeply we enjoy those things. And that's the reason, by the way, that the name of this sermon is Living in the Desert. Uh, and the emphasis there is on living. It's not called staying alive in the desert. It's not surviving in the desert. It's living in the desert. Our lives now are not how we want them to be. But despite that, we are living in the desert, recognizing every good thing, enjoying every good thing, recognizing the grace of God in every good thing. So, 
You remember we started out saying we're not invited to live in the past, we're not invited to live in the future, we live in the present. I said that was one of two things that we can do in this situation. The other thing, uh, and Lewis hinted at it in the passage we read, is living in eternity. Living in the present is not our only path, and it shouldn't be. You know, think about the Israelites again. They were looking to get to the promised land, weren't they? They had their 40 years of wandering, but then when they arrived in the promised land, what happened? Well, there were giants in the land. They were involved in battles. Uh, they were involved in warfare for years and years and years. And even after they'd conquered the land, they were never really free of war. They had civil wars. They had invaders. You know, whatever it is that we're looking forward to, and again, excuse me if I'm not as encouraging as you were hoping, uh, when this pandemic is over, whatever we're looking forward to, whatever our promised land is, that's not going to be free of difficulties. That's going to have its own problems. There are still going to be giants in the land that we live in. You know, we're still going to be living in a society that in lots of ways is hostile to us. That's just the reality. But the crucial thing is this. Ultimately, we're looking beyond this life. We're not just looking at how we can make these 50 or 60 or 80 years more pleasant. We're not just looking about shafts of sunlight through the clouds. We're looking at an eternity with the God who is the source of all joy. And this is so important. You know, sometimes I feel that we can see heaven as kind of far off and distant and vague and fluffy and a kind of consolation prize. Nothing could be further from the truth. God himself is the real reality. The whole physical universe that we exist in, we're told, is going to be rolled up like a cloak and thrown away. Everything that seems so real and substantial to us is flimsy and insubstantial compared with the reality of God himself. So although the present is where we are right now, although it's what we can touch and feel and taste, and it feels more immediate than eternity, the reality is that eternity is the true substance. And that's why Paul says this. And I'm nearly finished here. Just hear this from 1 Corinthians 15, same letter we've read from a couple of times earlier. He says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. See, everything that matters comes back to the goodness and the greatness of God. For Paul, everything that's going on in his life, his amazing successes in preaching, uh, all the fame that he would have accumulated by being such a successful ministry, all of that stuff is kind of irrelevant. It's not nothing, but it, it shrinks away. It vanishes in the light of the reality of who God is and of how he deals with us. When Paul says Christ has been raised from the dead, he doesn't stop with that. He says that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is the first of a great harvest. And we who know him and love him are that harvest. And this, in the end, is what I'm convinced is what our eyes should be on. Not the past, not the future, not even mostly the present and all the little joys of the present, but the great eternity that God has prepared for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of humans the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He himself is waiting for us. And he is our reward. Well, hi, guys. Um, and uh, it's a great thank you for the, the worship team uh, once again. And thank you, Mike, for a great message. Thank really you. appreciated that this morning. I think mm -hmm. many people would have found that really um, encouraging and helpful um, because it, it has been a bit of a desert, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the sense of, are we ever going to get out? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking, actually, I, I think this is probably only the third time I've seen you in person in the last 18 months almost. Yeah, it's been good, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You've been said. <laughs> I'm in for you. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've seen each other a lot online and yeah. messaging all the time.
but, but it just highlights the isolation that's kind of come on the back of um, yeah. everything. And um, I think that's been a real struggle. So uh, a question's come in here thinking about, um, isn't this a, a, like a test for us, you know, this desert time? So mm. I don't really want to speak into that at all um, because, um, yeah, I think it could be, couldn't it? Absolutely, it is, yeah. And um, I've often had this thing of thinking about tests. Where do they come from? Is it is it sent by God? Is it from the devil? Is it just the randomness of the world? What I realized is it makes no difference because wherever a test comes from, it's still just there. And the question is, how are we going to deal with it? How will we respond? Um, and in this case, you know, the answer is no surprise. It's what the answer always is. It's focus on God. See his goodness. Recognize his greatness. Way through the test. Mm. Yeah, no, and I, I often feel um, things that happen in our lives, you know, they are tests one way or another because they're testing us what's most important. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it can be good things can actually be a test because they can distract us, can't they, from the best, can't they? Um, and I don't know whether you, you can think of examples in your life at all where, where things come along which have tested you or stretched you or um, either good or bad, but actually deflected you from the main thing at all, whether that's um, sometimes where things come to our minds. But, uh, yeah, uh, you're right. It can go both ways. So I think about times when we've struggled for money. Uh, it, it can become very all-encompassing. You, know, it's, it, you can't not think about money in those situations. So that's very tough. But the opposite as well, you're right. Do you remember in the song, uh, You're Holding On To Me, the middle section goes, shall we see you in the blessing yet forget you in the trials? Sometimes I feel like it should be the other way around. You know, because at least in the trials, you're aware you need God. But sometimes at times of blessing, you can just kind of relax into it. Feel like, okay, I've got it made. No, and I feel that a little bit with this, um, this time, this pandemic, which obviously none of us, I don't think anyone's enjoying it. And you certainly wouldn't have wished it on, uh, on the world. And mm. clearly for some people, it's been utterly devastating. Um, and our hearts go out to them. Uh, but there is another sense that actually in the midst of this, it is focusing people's minds on what's really important. Um, and I think that kind of, I'm, I'm feeling it as a pastor at least, that people are going, okay, well, I've put my energy in my life in this direction. But actually, maybe there's something more important than actually career or money um, or all the things that we traditionally chase after and there's i think a more of a god awareness um, coming out as a result uh, yeah i think so it focuses the mind doesn't it when people see also the reality of death and i think it's easy especially for young people to to kind of feel as though everything is just going to carry on the way it is forever in a, in a nice way but to be brought up short and thought no actually we've got finite time here what are we going to do with it yeah no exactly so and I, and I think one of the things in the West, you know, we live in the affluent West, and mm. we were the, the, the top 8% of the richest people in the world. We may not feel very rich, but we are. That's where we are. Um, and uh, that becomes a massive distraction because we just get taken up with the things that the money can buy and mm. the consumerism, don't we? And, um, and that's surprise, surprise, why the West is probably the least spiritually focused and least living in eternity. Yeah, that's right. And again, I think about um, slaves in the pre-war American South and people who had nothing in this world. Um, it's maybe not surprising they focus much more on the next. Mm, yeah, definitely. So we've had a few questions come in which were kind of basically asked and then Mike answered the questions later. <laughs> in that's the good message. to know. Uh, so you were clearly um, uh, you're sort of anticipating the questions coming in, so that's great. Um, but I've got a question here. Uh, you say uh, we shouldn't live in the future, but we should live in eternity. But what is the difference between them? You know, isn't eternity the future anyway? Right. Uh, no, they look similar, don't they? So the future is in time. So we have our 70 or 80 years, whatever it is. Some of it's behind us. Some of it's ahead of us. What's ahead of it is the future. Eternity is so much bigger. It's so much broader. It's so much deeper. So eternity begins before the foundation of time not just before we were born, before the physical universe was around. And in fact, scientists, as I understand this, I, this is outside of my field, but my understanding is that time itself is part of this physical universe. So in a way, you can't even talk about eternity being before time, because it's, it's bigger than time. The very notion of time is contained in it. 
And that ultimately is our destiny. Again, this is what the Bible tells us. It's very hard for us to grasp. But we, each one of us, is in some sense greater than the physical universe. So it's quite a distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. And, and another question, um, is there a sense that actually until we become dissatisfied with the uh, present, mm. um, it becomes difficult to actually look forward into the, into the future and actually to see a, a sense of improvement? Yeah, yeah, it touches on what we were talking about before, doesn't it? That it's, it's often the tougher times that push us to see what's needed for not just this life, but eternity. Yeah. So you could almost think about, I don't know if I'm getting too abstract here, <laughs> but you could think about time as just a line laid out in front of you. So I uh, also don't know if I'm in the camera. Okay, here's your past, <laughs> and you go forward, and, and here's the present, and there's all the future. Yeah. So we can think about here, we can look back, we can look forward. What God tells us to do is look up. So not on the line at all, you know, beyond just can we make things a little bit better as we get here, but stepping right out of it into a completely different dimension. Yeah. No, and that's, I think for us who live in time, <laughs> it's very hard to sort of look outside that box, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but that's, that's really helpful. Um, and, and the question here is kind of, I guess, sort of highlighting William Wilberforce became dissatisfied with the slave trade mm. and, um, uh, and then helped people to see how unsatisfactory that was and therefore um, sort of led them into sort of uh, a, a different focus uh, yeah. in, in the world around. Can I, can I just yeah. clarify something on that? Yeah, so please, nobody hear me as saying what we do in time doesn't matter. I'm absolutely not saying that. So mm. yes, William Wilberforce, yes, abolishing slavery, and yes, all kinds of political and medical causes. So and absolutely, those things are important, mm. but they're not the ultimate important thing. No. no, we're kind of living, there's a higher level, isn't there, yeah. which... Um, which I think we only start to see as we begin to trust in Christ. And, um, and then when things happen to us, which may be good or bad, um, we start to go, actually, there's, there's, there's a higher agenda here at work. Um, and certainly, I think as Christians, um, I'm, I'm increasingly aware that actually the biggest agenda that God has in, in us is actually what he's doing in us, in our lives. It's not actually about our achievements and all the things that we do. It's actually right. our developing our character and making us more like Jesus. Yeah, I think that's very true. And we're, when we get to heaven, we're going to be really surprised about what God does and doesn't value in the way that we live our lives. Mm, yeah, I know exactly. Oh, that's so helpful, Mike. So really appreciate that. And uh, I think it's a real encouragement to us.